Oh, your screen is showing. Okay. That's the screen. Yeah. Screen. Okay. That's that's me coming in here. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, well, hello, folks. It's uh, 630, and I guess we will go ahead and get started. My name is Wendell Fuquay. I'm with the Sierra Club. I was on the uh, executive committee until just recently, and uh, we've had a couple people uh, uh, sick or not able to show up uh, for an, another meeting. So uh, I'm going to do the introductions tonight. Uh, we're going to um, talk about the Robert, uh, the L.B. Tobin Land Bridge, Robert L.B. Tobin Land Bridge. That's a crossing that connects the two sides of Phil Hardberger Park. We're gonna learn how this unique bridge came to be built in San Antonio and how successful it is in providing safe passage for wildlife and people. Uh, Casey Cowan is a park naturalist with the San Antonio Parks and Recreation Natural Areas. Shares the, she's gonna share the latest findings of the Land Bridge Wildlife Study now in its third year. Uh, Casey is Texas, born and raised. Uh, she graduated from Texas State University with a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology and worked for AmeriCorps in California, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in South Dakota, and then came back to San Antonio where she worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife at Government Canyon uh, State Natural Area, and eventually to the city of San Antonio and the Recreation Department where she is today. Uh, she maintains a certification as a wildlife biologist from the Wildlife Society. She holds an endangered species recovery permit for the golden-cheeked warbler from the U uh, USFWS and is an NOLS. NOLS, what does that mean, Casey? National Outdoor Leadership. Outmore, uh, National Outdoor Leadership Wilderness First Responder. Additionally, she is certified to teach 7th through 12th grade life sciences. Casey's passion lies in conservation of our natural resources. She's committed to helping protect wild things and ensuring future generations have the opportunity to experience and benefit from the natural world. Uh, let me get uh, Ariana. Is Ariana back there? We need to start our recording, and I'm not quite sure how to do that. It is recording. Okay. Okay. Very good. So our recording is going on. Uh, afterwards, for the question and answer session, if you all want to uh, stick around, we will turn off the recording at the question and answer session, so you don't have to worry about uh, having your uh, voice and face on, on the screen. Okay, Casey. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You can see me on Zoom. Hi, Zoomers. <laughs> all right, so uh, like Wendell said, I'm the parks naturalist. There used to be two of me. There's now just one of me. <laughs> um, but I will mention that Jewel, my um, old counterpart, helped me a lot with this in the beginning. So thanks, Jewel. Um, so we'll get started. Is there a clicker? Or do I do it? Oh, there it goes. Okay, so who's visited the land bridge? Okay, we got two people that, well, if you have not visited the land bridge, oh, I have. Oh, okay. <laughs> you should. Um, so it's located at Hardberger Park and it connects the two sides. You can park at Blanco or at the Northwest military side. It's just over a half a mile, right? From either one of those parking lots. Um, yeah, crosses over Forest Rock Parkway. So if you haven't visited, go visit it. So why did we build a land bridge in the first place? Why does anybody build land bridges or wildlife crossings? So the Texas Department, no, the Department of Transportation, um, the Federal Department of Transportation estimates that there are one to two million wildlife vehicle collisions every year. And the monetary value associated with those collisions is over $8 billion. So that includes things like car repair, medical costs, the law enforcement response, um, the first responders. Um, they even put a monetary value on the animal itself. I don't know how they get that figure. Um, but they, they do include that there. And then those wildlife vehicle collisions can cause a uh, long-term species survival to be threatened, right? So if you consider where those long stretches of highway where people are going very fast and there's rural pieces of land on either side and you have large herds of deer, other types of ungulates crossing the road, um, and you get large numbers of animals hit, right? So then you have a decrease in that genetic diversity of that population. Um, 
also if you consider animals that move slowly across the road um those guys are hit more frequently and then of course if you have any endangered or threatened species that are crossing roads if even just one is hit that's a threat to their population and so the major thing that these land bridges do is create that connectivity between the two pieces of land so it increases flow from animal the gene flow for animals going from one side to the other being able to mix up their genes more um, and cross more easily and more frequently and of course with building a land bridge, you get an increase in food, water, shelter. So you get an increase literally from the bridge, and then you get that more availability because animals are able to move more easily across to those, those basic needs. So I have some statistics from around the country. This is um, Trappers Point, Wyoming. I'm showing you my wall. So they had a number of wildlife um, crossing mitigations installed, and they saw an, a decrease in 80% of their wildlife vehicle collisions. So these obviously were places that had baseline data for their collisions. So a decrease in 80%, they saw an increase of 60% in their mule deer movement and 300 in their pronghorn. And that number is so staggering because the nature of how pronghorn move, they're not able to jump vertically. So they scooch under the bottom strand of barbed wire typically. And if they can't do that, they pretty much just get stuck at these barriers. So when you put a wildlife crossing, they're able to just funnel right into it and over um, without having to fight cars. Another one, BAMP Canada, they were one of the first people to install these um, wildlife mitigation features. So they have 40 as of now, and they saw a decrease of 90% in their wildlife vehicle collisions. Lastly, I have the Colorado Highway 9 Wildlife Crossing Project. This is actually one that we took a lot of information from um, for our study. But if you've ever been to the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park, like traveled on the west side, this is that highway. Um, they were having carcasses removed from the highway by the truckload. They were having so many um, deer hit and other ungulates. Um, so they installed a number of these wildlife crossings. They have culverts and um, different types of fences, and they saw a decrease of 92% in their wildlife vehicle collisions, as well as a 90% decrease in the number of carcasses that were they were removing from the highway. So how does our bridge, the Robert L. B. Tobin Land Bridge, stack up to a few of the others that we have here on the screen? This is not a comprehensive list, but um, I will note that this is a comparison of other mixed use style land bridges. Most of the ones that I was talking about before, if not all of them, were specifically wildlife crossings, which is a much more common type of land bridge. The mixed use with human and wildlife is a newer design concept. And our bridge was specifically designed for that. It was intentional in that it has a side that's just for humans. Not really, though, because wildlife certainly are using it. Um, and then a side that's supposed to be just for wildlife. And we did install some little chain links that block the um, maintenance paths that go to the wildlife side. And I've seen uh, much less use by humans on that side. So anyways, we have a, a, a berm that goes down the middle that bisects the two sides. So there's a real division happening. Not only that, ours is very wide at 150 feet. And then it's 165 at the base, kind of where it flares out. So the Memorial Park Land Bridge on the top right is in Houston. That just opened at the end of February. It's a double land bridge. I don't know if they call it that, but that's what I call it. <laughs> um, but it has a switchback pedestrian trail that goes up the side, the one in the front. And then the one in the back, back has um, just one that kind of circles up over it. But you notice that the top is all mowed. There's not a dedicated wildlife corridor. It's mostly used for recreation events and just hanging out, that kind of thing. So while wildlife are using it, I'm sure, to what degree, because there's no dedicated wildlife corridor, um, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure of any study that they're doing on, on that sort of thing. So the bottom left is the Gathering Place Land Bridge in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As you can see, it's also a double land bridge, but it has um, a lot of obstructions. There's a lot of obstacles that wildlife would have to overcome in order to reach that land bridge or to come from 
the other side and, and get to where they're wanting to go. So again, while wildlife, I'm sure using it to a degree because of all of those obstacles and no real dedicated wildlife path, um, that I'm unsure. The Cross Florida Greenway land bridge on the right is a dedicated mixed use land bridge. Oh, it just changed on its own. However, it is very narrow. And studies have shown that wildlife that are a little more wary to use these crossings tend to use them when they're um, wider. And I think the number is actually 150 feet. So we win. <laughs> we did something right, right? All right, so why do we want to do a study at all? Well, these mixed use land bridges are new. There's not a lot of science surrounding them. And so we wanna know, are they working as intended? Are animals crossing from one side to the other or are they just going up using resources and kind of going back to their other side, right? So the body of science that is in place now is mostly for those wildlife crossings and not the mixed use. Um, 270 have been done over the past four decades but only 77 of them actually look at the proportion of successful crossings to approaches. And so an approach is just when, like I said, the wildlife come up and then return back to where they came from. So our study will be adding to that 77 um, because we are looking at, at that figure. And you could say like, well, we can just like watch deer move from one side to the other. Um, we could just watch them go from here to there every day you could go up and just check, but we want to find signi uh, statistical significance, right? So we're collecting a lot of data to see for sure that that's actually happening. And what's cool that we're doing this, and it's um, such kind of a new thing that hopefully people will look at our study as sort of a guideline for developing new mixed use land bridges if they're um, trying to be intentional about helping animals cross from, from one side to the other. So how did we design it? Why is it progressing? Does anyone know why it's progressing on its own? Um, so I consulted with my old professor at Texas State University, Dr. Beach, and we were gonna mimic um, that Colorado nine study, but because there's so much vegetation and change in topography on our land bridge, it really didn't work. The features that they have in Colorado are more open. There's not vegetation. Um, so the design just didn't work. So what we came up with was splitting the bridge into three separate sections. So you'll see section one, two, and three. And within each of those sections, these numbers you see, I'm sorry, letters are um, a camera. So each one of those letters is a camera that's on the bridge. So each section is covered as evenly as we can to um, capture all the wildlife within each section. So um, an example of how this sort of uh, happens, what we're looking at. Say, for example, a deer crosses in section one at camera n an event is started and the event within this is our study right within that event if um is just a time parameter so within that time parameter if the deer also crosses at camera m in section two and camera k in section three then we would call that an event that event is success so the, the animal crossed all the way across the bridge and it was not an approach However, if it only came up to section one and two, and then within that event parameter, it never crossed in section three, we would say that that was not a successful crossing and it would be classified as an approach. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're wanting to know, are the animals using it all the way across or are they just coming up and then um, going back to the side that they came from? So we started with eight cameras and after two days, after we installed those eight cameras, they were non-programmable, so they were running 24 seven. Um, two of the eight cameras had 22,000 pictures on each of them. <laughs> and so we quickly realized that that was not gonna be something we could continue doing. Um, not only could we not check the cameras every two days, we didn't have enough resources to be storing uh, tens of thousands of images um, every week. So we paused and consulted with our friends over at the Conservancy <laughs> and, um, and the department, and we were able to get some programmable cameras. So where we sit now, and thanks to a generous donation, um, we were able to get, now we're up to 14 programmable cameras. 
So these cameras run from just before sunset all the way through the night and then just after sunrise. Because most of those images we were collecting, those 22,000 were of people walking on the bridge and were of like grass and things swaying in the wind. They weren't of wildlife. In fact, I did a 24 hour analysis on one of the cameras. So I compared it like the same day of the week, that same 24 hour period. Um, for a non-programmable versus a programmed one and found an 83% decrease in images collected. And of those, 14% of them on the programmable camera were wildlife. And the other one, non-programmable, only had 5% of wildlife. So not only were we collecting less images, but we were getting better data. We were getting more images of wildlife. So now we have 14 programmable um, running at those times of the day and everything's great. <laughs> so um, when I go out and check the cameras, I collect data on each and every camera, and that is the name of the camera, its um, overall functionality, how many images, the most important would be how many images, um, and then battery life, and I'll change SD cards and batteries as needed. And then I take those images, and I put them on our external hard drives. We have three 18 terabyte hard drives, one as a, um, our main and then two for backup. Um, I periodically review them. However, I do not look at all of them. I tend to only look at the cameras that um, I call my superstars because they always produce really nice pictures. And this is one of the cameras, that's A, that's my favorite camera. <laughs> um, it has a nice view shed. And it happens to be like right on a wildlife path that coyote and skunk and fox, armadillo, the whole gang um, likes to use. So I really like to look at that one. Um, however, I cannot look at all of them because we get millions of images every year. And uh, because of that, what if I just hit like, I don't know. I'll do this. I'll just deal with this continuing to move on. Um, because we get so many and we're not able to process the images by hand, uh, we have a partnership with Microsoft who has an AI model called the Mega Detector. And I'll explain that on the next slide, but then after that we go through, um, I, I process them through time-lapse, which I'll also touch on. But so Microsoft has a philanthropic program within their company and it's called AI for Earth. It's one of theirs. So AI for Earth is one of them. And they make a number of tools that scientists can use to answer questions they may have. One of the tools happens to be the mega detector. And it, um, it basically grabs the pictures and it puts bounding boxes over what it finds in the picture. Specifically, it'll be people, vehicle, or animal. And then it can also tell me if there's nothing in it. So it puts a bounding box over the thing that it finds. And then that number on the top is its confidence that what it bound the box to is actually what it is. So for example, the person in the middle, it's 100% is a person, 100% sure. But that one in the background is only 84%. We can tell it's a human, so that's good. But um, the model's only 84% and likely because that person's uh, obscured by grasses. So it's not a full human form <laughs> and not one that it's seen very frequently, I'm sure. So it's a, a mutually beneficial thing. It's a free service that Microsoft does um, for us. And we're teaching its model by giving it all these pictures. And then we're obviously getting to save a lot of time. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do the study in the way that we are without that. So I'm very thankful. So it, so it shoots me back these files that have the bounding boxes on them. And then I'm able to run them through another software called time-lapse which is also free from the University of Calgary. And what that does is basically quantify the, the images. So it, it lets you pull out data from the image that you otherwise would just be looking at with your eyes, right? So I can make a form that asks um, what species are in the animal or what species are in the picture, maybe like what section of the bridge that it's in, because that's important for me, uh, the time of day, that sort of thing. So with that, uh, with those Microsoft files that have already been categorized, I can tweak the ones that I look at and then be able to speed through this process a lot faster. And um, so yeah, it's really helpful. And if you have a smaller image set, then you can use this on its own and it's totally doable. But then it'll spit out um, like a spreadsheet that I can then use to run statistical analysis on. 
So moving forward, that's what we'll be doing is just collecting more data. The cameras are still out and running. We're set to go for five years. Um, however, I'm going to try very hard to run a statistical analysis this year, or I'm going to have Dr. Veach do it because that's what I look like when I start thinking about the statistical analysis. Um, and uh, we may be able to roll, if we find a statistical significance within our data set, then maybe we can roll back the timeline, but we'll see what happens there. Oh, it moved for me. Great. Okay. <laughs> so what we captured so far, sort of, um, this is the fun part. I know that first part's a little technical. Um, so if you're not into that kind of thing, sorry. Um, so what we captured so far, this is a list of um, what I've seen on the cameras, right? Uh, like I said, I don't look at all of them. So there's there could be something that I'm missing, but I will tell you that these are the species most likely to be seen and have been seen within Hardburger Park. The only thing that maybe could be on there is a porcupine, but no one's ever said they've seen one. Um, but I just, I wouldn't be surprised if we did end up catching one. Uh, yeah, so jumping forward, it's this is an axis deer. This is an invasive species. Um, of deer, and I've seen her in person one time. Jerry, have you ever seen her? No. Have you seen her? Nobody's seen her. Wendy has seen her. <laughs> I've seen her by the land bridge, and it was a couple of years ago, and she's always by herself, which seems unusual to me because these are more gregarious animals. It's like getting faster now, switching. <laughs> um, they're gregarious animals typically, so I think she's just um, like a bachelorette living her best life. She doesn't need no man, no baby. She's just doing her thing. Uh, the beloved bobcat. I, I suspected we would find them um, a little later on in the study, but I'm not sure why I even thought that because they've become quite uh, habituated to human activity and um, are quite urbanized animals at this point. So um, I think we have a good population of bobcat, and I can say that with some confidence because we have a mama and her two cubs in that picture on the top left. And they're about of the age where she's gonna be kicking them out. You can tell they're getting to be of that age where she doesn't want them around anymore. Um, the one on the bottom left and in the middle is actually the same individual. Um, so it crossed one section and then I caught it in another section. So if I can find it on the third section or whichever one it was, first or third section, um, then that would be a successful crossing of a bobcat. And then this one, this one in the middle-ish is just a, a newer picture I've not, no one's really seen yet. Um, and I love the bottom right one with the fluffy bobcat butt during the day. Uh, and something cool about bobcats, same with like tigers, is that they have unique striping on their legs. So if we wanted to get down to individuals, we could if we we're interested in that sort of thing. We've got gray fox. Um, the couple in the bottom middle, I catch on a camera. Most every time I check the camera, they're on that, they're they're in the images at nighttime. Um, so I'm not sure where they live. They come up through the side of the bridge. So that's also interesting. Uh, I don't see them necessarily crossing the bridge, but coming up through the side. So I don't know how we're gonna deal with that sort of thing. Um, and then top middle is cottontail. I am almost certain they live on the bridge, which is really cool. We've created more space for them to hang out. And since they're bobcats, uh, number one meal, then maybe that's why we have a good population of um, bobcat and them on the bridge so much. Got rock squirrel. I love this one of this one standing up, eating the seeds on the right. So cute. And of course the, the fox squirrel. We've got armadillo. The one on the picture on the right is unique in that it's two species in the same image. You don't see that very often. But in the, oh, it just turned off. Why? I swear I'm not doing this. Let me see. Do you think the uh, <clears throat> axis could mate with the white tail? I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not sure that there's cross. Um, hybridization between those two species, but I could be wrong. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. It's been like just going ahead, like I've, oh. like just skipping forward, and I don't know. Um, 
that's user error kind of thing. I wasn't touching it when it would do it. Yeah, and so... Then it just, like, turned off. <laughs> it was annoying. We're done. I just needed a break. Well, you may get a new one. What do you want to do? It would open the table now. What's this? So it like has a. So that it was. It looked like that. Was this like running? It wasn't. Well, I don't know. Well, we're almost done. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what slide you're on? Yeah. Or so we were with the armadillo Let's there. Go. Yep. Okay. And go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it's a series of images of that doe, like hearing the armadillo, and then. Like, oh, it's an armadillo. Although, you know, they kind of see in silhouette. So maybe she didn't even know. Maybe she smells them. I don't know. They know more than me. Um, and then the armadillo, of course, knows nothing about what's going on around it because it's can hardly hear or see. <laughs> um, so it's just doing its business grubbing. We've got skunk and raccoon. This is um, Pete and repeat at the bottom middle. I like the fox. They're typically in a group of three. However, I've been seeing them more in a group of two. <laughs> so maybe it's a family unit that's kind of split up. But um, on the bo bottom right is a, um, it looks like a domestic disturbance type of situation. It's like biting the other one's arm. I don't know if you can see it. It's easier to see it up here. But this one's biting that one's arm. <laughs> and it looks like it's like just annoyed by it. Like, okay, leave me alone. This is one of my favorite pictures that was at a um, one of the culverts where we used to have cameras as well um and it's like standing up like a human i just picture it like walking off got some great shots of red-shouldered hawks uh yesterday i think i saw it was probably this pair they're over by volker homestead um and there was a third one too that flew by but they were up in a tree together so I don't know if this is two individuals or the same guy, but I see them at the land bridge um, frequently. My favorite Virginia opossum. You may have seen this one on the top right is the ringtail, and it's got a spiny tailed lizard in its mouth. That one kind of ran the San Antonio media circuit. Doesn't know it's famous. Ringtail what? Uh, some people call it ringtailed cat, but it's a ringtail. It's a ringtail. Yep. Yep. So they are primarily nocturnal. However, I've ran into one during the day during a bird survey, it, like walked right in front of me. It was really weird. Um, but you'll find there are boreal, so they live up in the trees. So just always look up in the trees. <laughs> there's always something. There's sometimes something to be seen up there. Porcupine, ringtail. Then we've got our primary suspects. These are the white-tailed deer. And the bottom left is the Arnold Schwarzenegger of deer within Hardburger Park. This is, um, these are all during rut. Um, so the, the males get really enlarged necks because they're pumping with testosterone and looking for a mate, which is what happened in this bottom image. Um, so this is a series of images of him courting her. And then they mate two times. And then she lays down in front of the camera for like 30 or 45 minutes. So that was an interesting series of pictures and then you get this after that the cute little fawns um hardburger park has oh, hardburger park has a lot of deer um in fact they probably have too many deer we have too many deer um but nevertheless they are adorable little babies the next i should warn you the next one even though you've seen it twice now is graphics so if you're sensitive to that sort of thing um so the bottom left, we, we sometimes get some unusual images, right? The bottom left is a buck that has hardware disease, and that just means that it had something stuck to its head or its head stuck in something, uh, and it has to, like, rub it free. This poor guy had to do quite a bit of that, and it's, so it's got a flap of skin hanging over, um, so probably more prone to infection. I don't know the consequences of that, um, if he survived or not, but... 
Then the, the one on the right is a doe with an abscess. Um, typically you see that in the males that they'll have puncture wounds from fighting other males and then they'll get this abscess from an infection or something um, after they get wounded. And I think right after the last, pre the presentation I did for y'all, you saw one, didn't you? Or no, when I showed you this picture, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. She saw another one in person and it was a buck, right? Mm -hmm. With that. And then these are um, always my favorite pictures, really. The coyotes are so fun to watch. So I have a, the pictures in the middle are of um, one family for sure. We have two separate families and you can tell because this time of the year, the juveniles are of different age classes, just slightly, you can tell the difference. So this is the younger of the two groups. Um, on the bottom left, you can tell that they're eating okay. The bottom left and the top right, they've got a cotton tail and it's probably a scavenged deer leg. Um, the bottom right, I love too. I'm like all of them are my favorite, but um, just a really great picture. Oh, a coyote that stopped and posed for us. So beautiful. We've got mamas caught that are clearly nursing. Um, we've got juveniles, so obviously there's mamas nursing. And then the last two I'm gonna share with you are, are three are of the other family. So this is the other family of a different age class. These are the other juveniles. Um, so they're doing their training. This is what we call training. They're just practicing fighting like any pack of dogs, like domestic dogs do, coyotes do, um, just figuring out, uh, how to fight so they can do it in real life, but it looks, uh, very vicious. <laughs> um, and I, and I, after this study is done, I really want to go put these cameras on video so we can get some really cool videos of this kind of stuff happening, but yeah, that's the other. So their primary food source is going to be um, small mammals and even lizards and snakes. Um, they also eat berries. They're omnivores. They're not carnivores. Um, and they're also not primary. They're not only exclusively um, nocturnal. So lots of uh, myths to kind of bust about the coyote. They in a study that was done so if you look in the book of mammals of texas it'll tell you that they eat poultry first um but i'm don't know if that was a little bit biased because maybe there were a lot of farms around where they were doing those guts so they'll kill the coyote and check their guts for that sort of sampling um but yeah so they'll tell you poultry so they're eating birds too not deer they'll scavenge the deer they might kill a fawn if it's eating they're opportunistic of course Um, it's actually pretty interesting. Do you see that scat that's right there in the middle of the picture? Mm -hmm. Uh, this right here. So I, there is a picture of a coyote making that scat. <laughs> um, and I was so excited to go look at it because I wanted to see what was in the scat. And what I saw was a ton of persimmon seed. And, um, what I saw in person is what I would have told someone was raccoon scat. So it was really interesting to be able to see that all transpire and actually go and look at it. So they're eating a lot more. Um, I've even seen like a bunch of grass and coyote scat before. So, and same with bobcat, they'll even eat grass. Um, yeah. Did so you that, ever see the persimmon? The actual persimmon? Yeah, the oh, yeah, there's tons around oh. Hardburger Park, the Texas persimmon. But that's pretty much it. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't want to do it you want me to do it again? Let's, let's scroll back. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so special thank you to Stephen K. Robbins. They were the ones that made two generous donations to procure a lot of the equipment, most of the cameras that we have. And the Hard Rock Park Conservancy, they're so supportive. And of course, the department who lets me do this for my job. Beautiful. Y'all have any questions? I'm going to stop the recording and I'm not going to mess anything up. Okay. I see stop share. I see pause share. Won't you help me? So I don't mess it up. I'm, 
I feel like I'm pretty tech savvy, but for whatever reason, this is not liking me tonight. Oh, we do stuff. 